God's Supreme Audience to this class in the book of Revelation. We're doing our uh, review of the course. Uh, we were talking last week, uh, went through the chapters 1 and 2, uh, and found in chapter 1 that the outline of the entire book is given in chapter 1. Uh, he was, John was told to write those things which uh, uh, he saw and the things which are now, and that was the seven churches which were reviewing that, and then the things which will take place after this. We started uh, in chapter two on uh, the church of Ephesus, the uh, loveless church, the church that lost its first love. They quit, uh, they got more into uh, other programs and things and other than Jesus. I'll say this, that the church of Ephesus does not exist anymore lost its candlestick just like Jesus said it would uh, I've been to Ephesus and uh, in fact in the entire nation of Turkey uh, where this is located uh, there are only 2% Christians 98% are Islamic Muslims uh, Sunni and Shiites more Sunni than Shiites but uh, many of the Christian churches have been destroyed and uh, uh, and no longer exist. And, uh, chap and, and the next church we talked about was Smyrna over at, uh, uh, at, at present day Izmir. And uh, that was where Polycarp was the pastor. He was a disciple of John. And that was a very persecuted church. In fact, Polycarp ended up being burned and martyred in the Colosseum at, at uh, Smyrna. But God gave him some promises that, uh, that uh, they would have the crown of life they would be faithful unto death. And then, uh, and they shall not be hurt by the second death. We talked about death. There's two types of death, physical and spiritual, or the second death. And then we got into the third church, the compromising church. And uh, I also told you that each one of these churches of, of the book of Revelation is characteristic of a period of church history throughout this 2,000 years of church history. Uh, this is the third period of church history. This runs about three, uh, A.D. 300. And uh, this was the time Constantine came in as the Holy Roman Emperor. He, uh, he, he, he fused the church with the government and the political system because he was Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, some good things that uh, Constantine did and his mother Helena particularly about building uh, churches over historical sites in, in, in the Holy Land. But he also fused the church with the government, and that is always bad. <laughs> and so uh, in this church, it's called the, the, the corrupt church or the licentious church. Uh, one faithful martyr there was Antipas, who was, uh, Jesus knew who Antipas was. Do you know that Jesus knows who you are and what you're doing in the church? Every one of us. And he calls Antipas his faithful marcher. And uh, he was the pastor of that church at Pergamos. But then they went out and killed him. Uh, he also said, I know where Satan's throne is located. Now, uh, Satan's throne uh, started, you know, in, uh, in Babylon, uh, the old Babylonian Empire. And also, he had a throne over there in, uh, at the time of Adam and Eve uh, when he uh, came to deceive uh, Eve and, and got Adam to rebel. And uh, they, they just handed their authority over to, to Lucifer. And he became the god of this world system. Well, then uh, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar became the, uh, the uh, emperor or the king of, of, of Babylon, uh, there was the seat of Satan at that time. And, uh, and Jesus knew it was. They, they worshipped a god called Marduk, and uh, they had all kinds of uh, evil practices. They did uh, sun worship, moon worship. They, they built big ziggurats up to the moon to worship the moon god. Uh, they, they were into women worship. Uh, the, 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 the women... Uh, worship that came out of that is still prevalent today. Uh, and then uh, after the Babylonian Empire failed, uh, that uh, 
influence was moved over to Pergamum because uh, Pergamum became the uh, center of Asia Minor, uh, and that's where the capital was of Asia Minor under the Roman Empire. Atticus had, had uh, bequeathed that to the Roman Empire, and uh, so the emperor, the, the emperor uh, or the governor, not the emperor, the governor of Pergamum was really the seat of Satan uh, at that time. And then from Pergamum, Satan's throne moved to Rome, Rome. And that's where, quote, Satan's seat sits today is in Rome. Now, uh, you'll have to follow it, but in this book here, by Clarence Larkin. He follows it pretty good. He writes a pretty good history of how Satan's throne moved all the way down to Rome. And, uh, and it became very corrupt, as you know. Uh, and then the uh, uh, church of Thyatira was another corrupt church. And in this church, uh, they had a doctrine of Balaam. They also had the doctrine of uh, uh, Jezebel. At Thyra Tyra. And uh, Thyra Tyra, uh, uh, nobody really knows who Jezebel was, but Jesus knew who she was. And she caused uh, the people in the church to commit sexual immorality uh, in that church. And also, she brought in the doctrine of Balaam. All that was uh, evil in the sight of God. Thyra Tyra, now remember, uh, is also the place of purple. Off the, off the Lycus River, that's where uh, they got this snail that excreted purple. And uh, the woman, the first woman convert in Europe under Paul's ministry was from Thyra Tyra, a seller of purple. Remember, remember that. It was a woman that was the first, uh, the very first convert in Europe. Not a man, a woman. And so, uh, uh, and then there was a warning given to that church. And uh, it says, uh, And he overcomes and keeps my works until the end. To him I will give power over the nations. Uh, and that will happen during the millennial reign of Christ. We will have power over the nations during the millennium. And verse 27, He shall rule with a rod of iron. And that's Jesus. And they shall uh, be dashed into pieces like the potter's vessel. And uh, he and then uh, let's look at Sardis is the dead church. Now the big condemnation against Sardis was they had stained their garments. Jesus said, some of you have stained your garments. How did they stain their garments? They started offering incense up to uh, the, the god of Domitian. Uh, Domitian was uh, uh, the brother of uh, Titus who followed him. He declared himself to be a god. And he, he wanted incense offered up to him as worship. And uh, the Jews were not supposed to offer any incense to any, any god other than Jehovah. And Christians were forbidden to worship any other god. And so to get into marketplaces and to, to maintain society, status quo, uh, there were these pot, uh, pans of incense with a flame burning there. And when you went up to, say, get into the mall to shop, you take a pinch of incense and throw it into the fire as a, as a way of worshiping uh, Domitian <clears throat> and these false gods that set themselves up to be God. They deified themselves. Uh, he also warned uh, the church of Sardis if they didn't repent, come back to him uh, and quit staining their garments that uh, he would come upon them like a thief in the night. And that bunch of people knew exactly what that meant uh, in the history of, of Sardis. And then we get to the next church, is the Church of Philadelphia. We call that the Faithful Church. Now, this, uh, this dead church, this dead church, Sardis, was a period of the Dark Ages, from about 500 to 15, 1400. Uh, it was, the, and the reason it made it so dark was that the Catholic Church forbid any translation of the Bible and anything other than Latin. So they, they took the language of the world, which they made Latin, which very few people could read and write, made that the language of the, the world, 
so people couldn't get enlightened by reading the Bible. There was nothing else to read but Latin, and they couldn't read it. So only thing they got was what somebody told them. And every pope that came in changed up the Bible and changed up things to what he wanted. Like Boniface the uh, First um, uh, in 605 A.D. said that the word of the pope was greater than the word of God. And so they were to listen to the Pope and not worry about the Bible. And uh, so all that became what we call the Dark Ages because people could not read. They were not enlightened. And it wasn't until uh, 1284 uh, when John Wycliffe comes along and starts translating the Bible, uh, the uh, Hebrew Scriptures, I guess a Greek, really the Greek ones, into English. And you were forbidden to do that. If you got caught, you were burned at the stake. But Wycliffe took a chance, and he went ahead, and he was teaching over at Oxford, and and uh, he would, uh, and, and this is what Wycliffe would do. He would teach his students in English and not Latin. And he had the biggest classes at Oxford. He was sought after, and finally got kicked out of Oxford. And then he uh, went over to uh, a, a small church, and uh, was running a church over there, and uh, he made a translation of the Bible in English. And he died in the pulpit one day, one Sunday. And uh, they buried him. But the Catholic Church hated him so much when the next pope came along, they dug, exhumed his body, they burned his body publicly, his bones, ground them up in the, and threw them in a the river. Because they hated him so much for... for Publishing in English. Well, who followed him? Well, you had a lot of followers after that. Uh, the most notable is Tyndall, William Tyndall. And Tyndall also took a lot of Wycliffe's uh, writings and translated them over into English. You had Martin Luther himself that translated into German. And he was uh, he he and Tyndall were God's outlaws, really. They were uh, they were hiding out uh, miraculously. Uh, Luther was hidden out for two years in a castle with his friends. And let me tell you, they were looking all over the place for him. They wanted to burn him at the stake. But he was a leader of the Reformation, uh, particularly the German Reformation. And he would translate those into German. And then Tyndall's group was translating the Bible into English. And they were hiding the Bibles in feed sacks and smuggling them in to the countries. And then people would would uh, take the Bibles out of the feed sacks and then distribute them to people. And so they could read in English. And then uh, there was uh, there was Erasmus was a translator. And then you had uh, 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 many other uh, translators. I mean, once it broke out, you had a lot of translators. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, of course, they went up to Switzerland and hid out from the Catholic Church uh, who sent out people to find you and bring you in and burn you at the stake. So it, it was a time of, 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 of darkness, and that's why it's called Sardis, the dead church area. But then what happened? Well, you, you had in, uh, in 1517, you had Martin Luther, who, uh, who, who nailed the theses on the, his 95 theses on the Wittenberg church door, uh, which began the Reformation. And we just talked about that on October the 31st. That's the, uh, uh, the Reformation Day. And uh, that began to spur on something new. And then this talks about that period from, from 1517 all the way up into the 1900s, probably mid-1900s uh, mid is the church of Philadelphia. The Philadelphia church is a faithful church. Uh, a couple of things I want you to look at that is in verse 10, in uh, 310. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, I believe that's the tribulation period. And uh, what that is is a promise from Jesus that for those that are faithful to him will not go through the tribulation period. Uh, and, and then he goes down to verse 12, and he says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, uh, and he shall uh, 
go out no more, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, and my God will write on him my new name. And I understand it's going to go on your forehead. So uh, that's some promises that we get for being faithful in the church today. And Philadelphia is the only church that was not condemned. Uh, Smyrna was not really condemned, but it, uh, but it didn't get the, 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 the great commendations that uh, the church of Philadelphia got. And then that period uh, from the 1900s on is called the lukewarm church, and that's where we're at today. We are in the Laodicean church age. The Laodicean, that's the lukewarm age. And you can see it. Uh, on the news and you can see it what you hear and read about the lukewarmness of the church today it, it, a lot of had a lot to do with marriage what the definition of marriage is uh, also about abortion life uh, uh, there's a lot of things there uh, the deity of Jesus Christ himself these cults like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and all these uh, cults that uh, don't believe in the deity of Christ. Uh, the attack on the Trinity of of, uh, of the doctrine of Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and and, uh, and just the laxity of the uh, lukewarmness of the people going to church and supporting the church. Uh, and uh, Paul warned about that in uh, in Second Timothy that they would have a form of godliness. But no power and churches would have a form of godliness but no power in it so uh, I believe that uh, uh, this was a uh, this period that we're in now it's called the, the apostate we're in a period of apostasy and this was also said in uh, uh, second Thessalonians chapter 2 that before the rapture of the church it would be a, a departure a period of of apostasy and also in 1st Timothy 4 verses 1 and 2 Paul warned that there would be a falling away which is the word apostasy uh, from the faith and then people would begin to worship the doctrines of demons and seducing spirits which is Satan worship so there is a lot of things there that we see in and uh, we are in that period of time. And this is the last church age period before Jesus comes. And uh, But let's look at a couple of promises he makes up here in the Laodicean church. Now, the Laodicean church was a very wealthy church, and it, it was acting like they didn't need Jesus, that uh, that they can do everything on their own. They didn't need, they didn't need Jesus. And it says here, uh, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke, chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. Now, there's two ways you can take that scripture. For the sinner, Jesus is knocking on the door of the heart to come into their hearts. And if they'll just open the door, he'll come in and take up residence. Also, it's a picture of Jesus knocking on the door of the church trying to get back into church because they had, he's been kicked out of the church. So think about that. And he says, to him who overcomes, I will grant it to him to sit on my throne and, I, and as I also overcame and sat down with my father on the throne. Now, how do you overcome? Well, 1 John 5, 4 says that you overcome by faith in Jesus Christ. And you, uh, as you have faith in Jesus Christ, uh, you are a world overcomer. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says uh, to the churches. Now, what we're getting ready to do now is we're getting ready to, to change the scene now, go, transition in from chan, uh, chapter 3 to chapter 4. Uh, remember, Jesus told John to write the things which he saw the things which are the churches, and now what are to come to pass after this. After what? After the church age is complete, Jesus is taking the church out of the earth to heaven. 
So that's what we're going to see at the beginning of chapter 4. This will be the scene that goes from earth now to heaven. You will not see the church mentioned again until, until chapter 19 of Revelation, which means that all the things that are going to go on in the book of Revelation that we're going to study, the church is in heaven and not on the earth. And those that have been left behind will be going through this seven-year period of tribulation on the earth. So let's look at the throne room in heaven. And, you know, this gives you a pretty good picture of what happens around the throne of God. Uh, you know, eye has not seen nor ear heard the great things that God has stored up for those that love him but are revealed through the Spirit to us who believe. In other words, we can get a glimpse of heaven right here with the throne room. It says, after these things I looked. After what things? After the church age. After the last, in the end of the church age, when the last trumpet, uh, when the last trumpet sounds, the church is taken out of the earth. And behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet, was like a trumpet. In other words, there's going to be a trumpet. So if we go back over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we look at verses uh, 14 through 18, what we're going to see is that there's going to be a trumpet sound and then a voice that says, come up here. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive and remain will be caught up to be with the Lord. That's a picture of the rapture of the church. Jesus takes the church out of the earth before the tribulation. He says this, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. After again, after this is the church age. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Now what, what is said is that we're going now from the earth to heaven, and we will stay in heaven now for the next uh, what, 16 chapters. And he who sat down, there was like a, a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. In other words, this rainbow that's around it talks about eternal life. Eternal life. God is eternal life. He's eternal. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. They had crowns of gold on their hands. Now, the, who are the 24 elders? Twelve of these elders represents the Old Testament saints. Twelve of the elders represents the New Testament saints. Notice that the, uh, the representation of the elders had golden crowns on. And we talked to you about uh, the rewards you get in heaven for your good works. And you get crowns. There's five crowns you get that you can get. There's the crown of life, the, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of exaltation. Paul mentions all these crowns. They're imperishable wreath. Uh, those things are crowns. And notice there that they, the, the elders are, are crowned with those for having good works. And he says, uh, and from the throne... The lightnings, thunderings, and voices, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which is the seven spirits of God. Now, it's one Holy Spirit with seven manifestations. Uh, one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ himself, who comes into our hearts at the new birth. The Spirit of grace, the Spirit of supplication, the Spirit of thanksgiving, all these are different manifestations of the Holy Spirit. One Holy Spirit seven different manifestations and uh, before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal now most writers believe that that sea of glass represents the church standing before the throne pure as crystal and glass before God and then he talks about the four living creatures who are cherubim angels that are that have eyes all around and they guard the presence and throne of God. And uh, one was like a lion, the other one was like a calf, the other one is like man, and the other one's like an eagle. Now that those four deals is where Amy Lee Simple McPherson got the four square gospel. 
she, uh, that's where she came up with the four square church. And uh, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they did not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. And then it goes on to whenever the living creatures uh, give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders all fell down before him who sits on the throne and worshiped him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, you re to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and your will, they uh, e exist and were created. Now, remember, we're still in heaven now, and now John sees the activities that are going on in heaven and around the throne, and now this is where the Lamb takes the scroll, the seven-sealed scroll, uh, what we will call the seven seals, that he'll get ready to open. And you, as you see here, he said, I saw... In the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? And no one in heaven and on earth and under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose the seven seals. Now you know who he is. That's Jesus. Jesus is worthy because he's the one who went to the cross and died on the cross, and he paid the price, and he's worthy now to open the seven seals. Now I want to tell you this. The seven seals are seven seals of judgment. That he's going to open up on the earth. He has gone from Savior in the age of grace that we're in now to judge and ones that's going to open the seals and pour out judgments upon the earth. People have a chance to accept him now. This is the time of grace. All you have to do is believe on him, accept him as Lord and Savior, and you'll be you'll escape the tribulation period. But those that don't are going to get left behind, and it's going to be terrible. <clears throat> and I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, four living creatures. In the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out in the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And then... Uh, now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell, fell down before the Lamb, each having uh, a harp and a golden bow, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, this is something that's interesting, the prayers of the saints. When you pray, your prayers leave your mouth and they go up, and you think they're gone, but they go to heaven, and when they go to heaven, God takes those prayers and he keeps them. He stores those prayers. They're called the prayers of the saints. And uh, he keeps them some in this uh, in this uh, uh, bowl of incense, but also under the golden altar. So there's a your prayers are, are are valuable to God. And then it says here, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals, for you were slain, and you redeemed us to God by your blood, and out of every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. And having made us kings and priests. To our God, we shall reign on the earth. Now, remember last week I talked about <clears throat> in Revelation 1 5, it talks about us being made a king, a kingdom of priests, or kings and priests, to rule in the kingdom of God. Now, when are we going to rule and reign as kings and priests? Well, during the millennium, when Jesus is ruling out of Jerusalem. And this whole earth, we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And uh, we will be over the nations. We will carry out judgments. We will be in charge of a lot of things that, we, that God will have us do. We'll be working basically uh, 
for Jesus, but will also be the wife of the Lamb. Remember that. We are married now to Jesus. Back in the earth, and uh, there'll be certain parts of the world that you'll be sent to, and you'll rule and reign over those nations, and some cities, and some places. But one of the things that will be prominent during the millennium is capital punishment uh, for those that rebel against the rule of Jesus. And we'll be the judges over those cases. And so, remember that. Verse 11, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. The number was 10,000 times 10,000 times thousands, which means innumerable numbers of angels. Worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom. Now think about the number of angels it takes just to minister to the heirs of salvation. I told you that each one of us when we're born is assigned a guardian angel. That angel comes down and stays with you your entire life on earth. But then when you get born again, God assigns more angels to you because you are an heir of salvation. They are ministering spirits to heirs of salvation. So you probably have another two or three after the new birth. And depending on your ministry and all that, and you need protection, God assigns more angels to you. So think about that. So if, you, if there's 2.3 billion Christians in the world, and each one is assigned two or three angels, you can see how many angels it takes just to do that part, not counting all the angels that are in heaven that minister to God. So that's why it said, uh, it says here, ten thousands times ten thousands times thousands of thousands. You know, you could get up into the trillions, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and angels are spirit beings, and they don't take up space. So uh, they, you, can be, have, you can have a lot of angels right in here right now, and I believe we do. Each one of y'all, when you came in, you brought some angels with you. Uh, in the church, we'll have angels all around. And then they sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying. Now, I don't know what this means, such as in the sea. It's like they're a different group. Those that were born at sea or buried at sea or something. And, it, and you know, in uh, Revelation 20, it says, and the sea gave up her dead. So why, why are they staying contained in the sea? Why aren't they either in heaven or hell or, or wherever they are, you know? So that's something I'll ask Jesus when I get there. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. So we see in, the, in heaven, what's one of the number one things we see going on in heaven? Worship. Worship. And, uh, and, and that's what we'll be doing for eternity. Around the throne. Uh, we, we have an eternal God. We will be living there for eternity. Uh, and then God brings the new city down uh, where we'll take up residence in the new city. Now in chapter 6, we'll get into this just to kind of a preview it. We're going to start talking about the, oh, the seven seals, this uh, scroll. Hi, Larry. The uh, seven seals that Jesus will begin to open. And uh, in, number, in, in Revelation 6, the first seal that he opens is the uh, Antichrist. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had one bow and a crown, one crown. And was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, uh, this is a picture of the Antichrist. Now, I want you to understand that the Antichrist always tries to be a counterfeit of what Christ is. Jesus has many crowns. 
He doesn't have to go out and conquer because he's already conquered. He doesn't need a bow because out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword. He just speaks the word. So this is a picture of distinguishing between the Antichrist and the true Christ. Now, the Antichrist will come into the world and try to look like a Christ who can solve everybody's problems during the tribulation period. I believe the Antichrist is already alive in the earth today. He's being trained and groomed for what he's going to do, but he doesn't know he's the Antichrist. The Antichrist will come out of Syria, and he'll either be a Syrian-born Jew or he will have some Syrian blood in him. He may have been born in Israel. But he's going to have to be part Jewish, I believe. And he'll come from the tribe of Dan because the tribe of Dan has uh, on its standard, the flag is a serpent. Out of that tribe of Dan will come a, is like a serpent. Uh, the tribe of Dan uh, in the... Uh, Proportionment of the land during the uh, time of Joshua was given all the land up around Mount Hermon all the way up to Damascus, Syria, and down into uh, northern Galilee. So uh, think about the characteristics. Syrian-born Jew. Uh, he'll be from the, the old tribe of Dan. And I believe he has to be Jewish because the, I don't believe the Jews would make a treaty for seven years with anyone that they couldn't trust. And they would think, since this person is of Jewish lineage, they could trust this individual to write a seven-year treaty, peace treaty, which will begin, when he signs the treaty, begins the tribulation period. And that's in Daniel chapter 9, uh, 24 through 27. He will establish a covenant. Oh, and by the way, when we finish the book of Revelation, we will go and do the book of Daniel. And then we'll tie Daniel and Revelation together and show you how that all works. So uh, the first seal is open, is the Revelation of the Antichrist. Uh, it's a white horse. The next horse is a red horse. And uh, that is war. And uh, it's a fiery red horse that came out representing war, and I believe that will be Ezekiel 38. 37 and 38, when Russia tries to move into Israel and God destroys it, and there will be a great uh, a war there. And then following that is the third horse, which is the black horse, which brings, after war, brings famine. Nothing will grow because I believe there's going to be a lot of radioactivity in the land. And it says here that uh, uh, things will get, food will really be getting hard to get. Because it says here, uh, this, this horse has a pair of scales to weigh out grain. And uh, it says a quart of wheat for a denarii. Uh, one quart of wheat will cost you a whole day's salary to get one quart of wheat and three quarts of barley. Barley is not as good as wheat for a denarii, a whole day's work, if you can get it. And then it says do not harm the oil and the wine. So that, that brings... War brings famine. And then the last is the pale horse, and that is death and Hades that follows. And uh, it says here one-fourth the entire world uh, will die of uh, the sword and hunger. And the beast of the earth. Now, I heard it taught, I think, by uh, Hilton Sutton or one of those teachers that said that God is going to, you know how right now, Beasts are afraid of us as humans. You know, they run a deer or something like that. Uh, you know, your wild animals, uh, coyotes and all them are run from humans. But in the tribulation, God's going to change it back to where the beasts are not afraid of humans. And, pe and these beasts will attack people uh, as carnivores. And it's be a totally different thing during the tribulation period. So anyway, uh, we're going to stop there for today we uh, will get back on the fifth seal next week and talk about the seals and then we're going to go into the next set of judgments which are the trumpet judgments and then we'll go into the bowl judgments now remember each set of judgments gets worse and worse and worse uh, until we get to the end of this whole uh, thing of the battle of Armageddon
I want to thank you for uh, joining our class today. Uh, we'll be back with you next week in this review. Uh, we'll try to pick it up uh, a little quicker uh, as we cover this. And, uh, but there's just a few things you need to learn and remember. And uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, and tonight is the Thanksgiving service at 6.30.